So uh, tonight's program is called The Truth About Roswell. It's been over 70 years since the Roswell Daily Record first blared the viral headline, RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region back on July 8, 1947. Uh, joined five-time Boston and New England Emmy Award-winning folklorist John Horrigan as he presents a new chron chronology of the events that led to speculation of an alleged UFO crash. John will, re will reveal previously undisclosed details of the fantastic tale along with refuted testimonies culled from his own exploration trips to the region back in 95, 96, and 97. John Horrigan is the host and co-creator of the Folklorist television series, which op offers a captivating look at some of the lesser known occurrences in history. As I mentioned, he has won five uh, Boston and New England Emmy Awards for his role on this show. Uh, he's also a prolific professional sports announcer and hooray, sports are back this week. Uh, narrator, historical researcher and lecturer who has performed in over 2,500 venues across North America. So all 40 of us, let's give a big round of applause to John for joining us here tonight. And John, you can take it away. Thank you, Robert. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us this evening on this hot evening. I hope you're staying cool and staying safe and practicing social distancing. And I hope that you're all well. A uh, special thanks, as Robert said, to the friends of the Tewksbury Library and also to the Tewksbury Cultural Council for bringing me on board. So the Roswell incident, every July it comes around. I'm not gonna go over what uh, Robert in, just said. I won five Emmy Awards. I was very, very lucky. That's the same suit, different time, tie, different shirt. One time I shaved, one other I didn't. Now I'm sporting a Peter Tork from the monkey's hairdo. That's what COVID does. Um, I was lucky to get a bunch of uh, Emmy nominations, 20 uh, New England Emmy Award nominations, 13 Tele, Tele Awards, seven Communicator Awards, and then New TV and Newton Mass went back to back nationally for arts and entertainment, the Alliance of Community Media. But unfortunately, it was a critically acclaimed show that nobody was watching, so it was canceled in 2016. So Robert mentioned I'm a professional sports announcer, although I just retired after 26 years as the New England Patriots basketball announcer. But I love history. I was literally on the Concord River paddling underneath Old North Bridge uh, this morning. So I love history. And uh, this is a text-driven lecture for those who may have difficulty hearing or if you have trouble listening like me. I have a tendency to speak too fast. That's the, the hockey announcer in me. So please hold all comments and questions until the conclusion of my presentation. So um, I guess just want to admit John Hammer there. So the Roswell incident. Um, a lot of people have backdated themselves into the story. Uh, about this story that what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to keep it to the timeline up until the story was retracted. Uh, since that time, so many people have, have uh, put misinformation and disinformation into this incident. Uh, I'm not going to talk about their, their uh, encounters. Jim Ragsdale, out. Uh, Glenn Dennis, the mortician, perhaps out. I might speak about him at the end. Gerald Anderson from the Plains of San Augustine. No, nope. I will mention Barney Barnett at the end. Um, and then Frank, uh, uh, another guy, Frank Kaufman, I'm not going to be mentioning their story. So this thing happened 73 years ago. And since 1994, many people have backdated themselves into the story, but they are inconsistent to the agreed upon timeline. So what I'm doing is taking direct quotes in, from the witnesses from the very first published book on this incident, known as the Roswell incident by Charles Berlitz, famous writer, and William L. Moore. It was uh, first came out in 1980, and it was a seminal book, but today some data appears to have been embellished or even created. Um, is this the first and only flying saucer crash? So I'm from the understanding that if there was, is one flying saucer crash, there's got to be several, right? Uh, I don't think that all of a sudden they got the word back to their home planet and they designed out whatever <laughs> errors were in the uh, design of the aeroform. So. Or was this a deliberate misidentification to provide cover for a Cold War espionage operation? 1947, Cold War is heating up between Russia and the United States. Either way, there was a cover up. That's true. So it was either clever, clumsy, or a combination of both. And I also referenced Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt's excellent first two books from 1991 and 1994. The first was 1991, UFO Crash at Roswell. And then in 1994, they released the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell. But unfortunately, they contained the uh, testimony of Frank Kaufman in that book. 
and Jim Ragsdale. So as uh, Robert mentioned, I was in Roswell in July of 1995, 1996, and 1997. And I believed when I went down there. And I've walked on the actual debris field. We're not talking about a saucer impact site. site. We're talking about where debris was found. And some of the accounts from alleged witnesses now need to be retracted. They backdated themselves into the story and incorrectly, I might add. So for Roswell, it's time to quit Roswell, in my opinion. No more stories, please. It all started on June 25th, 1947, or June 24th, 1947, when a pilot named Kenneth Arnold reported seeing several objects while flying near Mount Rainier, Washington. His descriptions of the objects that flew like geese and moving like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. And this became the term flying saucers and thus the age of the UFO was born. Many newspapers in the country picked up the story from the wire services and the publicity gave birth to a rash of sightings that kept the papers and the public fascinated throughout that summer of 1947. This is the actual uh, drawing that was made um, by Kenneth Arnold of what he saw on June 24th, uh, 1947. You can see discoidal in shape. And he said, and you're gonna see a lot of quotes here, direct quotes, I was fascinated by this formation of aircraft. They didn't fly like any aircraft I ever had ever seen before. The elevation of the first craft was greater than that of the last. And again, this is his depiction there. They flew in a definite formation, but erratically. As I described them at the time, their flight was like speedboats on rough water or similar to the tail of a Chinese kite that I once saw blowing in the wind. Or maybe it would be best to describe their flight characteristics as very similar to a formation of geese in a rather diagonal chain-like line as if they were linked together. As I put it to newsmen in Pendleton, Oregon, they flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. Many newspapers in the country picked up the story from the wire services and the public was kept fascinated throughout that summer. Could I ask you to mute your microphone for those of you that just joined? Thank you. Wendy, if you could just mute your microphone, that would be great. In the summer of 1947, the phrase flyer saucer then entered the vocabulary of popular American culture. And before this period, there were some rare and unverifiable stories of disc shaped aircraft seen around the world, but only a few significant reports of any kind came to light after a series of so-called phantom airship sightings in America in late 1896 through the middle of 1897. They began in uh, California, Sacramento, California, and ended in Chicago. And you've heard the band uh, Foo Fighters, um, David Grohl, but the truly notable incidents, although not really describing saucers, centered around the Foo Fighters of World War II, a nickname taken from the comic strip Smokey Stover, he would say, where there's foo, there's fire. As pilots from both the Allied and German Air Forces reported seeing strange objects and glowing balls of light approach their aircraft. This is a photograph of some Russian fighters uh, that are approached by foo fighters or balls of light. And then after World War II came the Scandinavian ghost rockets. Many residents of Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden reported seeing objects in their skies with vapor trails at a high altitude, and the press deemed them as ghost rockets. And of course, uh, at the end of the war, not only did German uh, sci rocket scientists come to the United States, some of them went over to Russia. So these were perhaps experimental rockets being fired off from um, Russia. So the disc reports came from all over North America and around the world in 1947. Many were seen traveling at tremendous speeds, flying extremely high, sometimes hovering, and on numerous occasions making controlled changes in their flight path. These cases remain a mystery because missiles of the day were only being tested in specific designated areas and had little endurance or range. The next generation of rockets like Sputnik that were capable of intercontinental flight or Earth orbit were still a decade away. Aircraft, on the other hand, had not yet attained reliable means of reaching supersonic speeds or altitudes over 40,000 feet or developed any sort of methods to hover. So these objects were performing uh, maneuvers that, were, that, uh, that our craft of the time could not attain. 
So because a large percentage of the first disc sightings occurred during daylight hours, astronomical events are difficult to associate with any but a few of the reports, bolides, meteors, meteorites, etc. Remember, there was no space junk up during 1947. Today, if you go outside, you'll be able to see satellites on demand, Starlink. So accounts from rep reputable witnesses during 1947 are significant because they had not yet had the opportunity to have their observations tainted by a vast body of previously published UFO lore. You saw that in the 1950s with all the great movies that came out, sci-fi movies, um, and that culminated in a spat in July of 1952 where UFOs were actually seen flying over the White House and the Capitol building and jets were actually scrambled. So the military started a formal UFO investigation by the end of 1947, although as early as July, Army, Air Force, and Naval Intelligence, as well as the FBI, had studied some of the more well-publicized reports, but less than 5% of the 1947 incidents were even indexed in military files. Many of those can be found in the National Archives holdings of the United States Air Force Project Blue Book Files. 853 accounts of flying saucer sightings appeared in North American newspapers, and there were 11,000 newspapers publishing uh, in that era in 1947. As stated, the term UFO simply did not yet exist. The media dubbed the strange objects flying saucers and disks following the Kenneth Arnold sighting of June 24th. Those terms would predominate in the popular press until well into the 1950s. Now, the Roswell saga actually began in Silver City, New Mexico on June 25th. Dr. R.F. Sensabogger, a dentist, reported sighting a saucer-shaped UFO flyover that was about one half the size of the full moon. Two days later, in Pope, New Mexico on the 27th, W.C. Dobbs reported a white glowing object flying overhead not too far from the White Sands Proving Grounds. So let's stop right here. Where these objects are seen, with the exception of the Arnold sighting near Mount Rainier, are in a super sensitive part of New Mexico. Uh, this is where uh, Trinity site was, uh, where they exploded the first, detonated the first test nuclear weapon. It was where the 509th Bomb Group was, the only atomic wing of the United States Army Air Force. There was no such thing as an Air Force. So if you see AAF, it's Army Air Force. And also um, rocketry, missiles were being fired off at the White Sands Proving Grounds, which would later uh, become the White Sands Missile Range. So these objects, if they were um, from a, a, another galaxy, planet, or otherwise, they picked the right area. And again, uh, <clears throat> we had detonated nuclear weapons in 1945. Rocketry began in Germany in 1944. We proved that we could get off the mud ball. <clears throat> and then the third thing was we were mass broadcasting radio signals. In fact, the Jack Benny show, it's now estimated, of the early 1930s, which was broadcast on 100 radio networks across the United States, they believe those radio signals now are out past at least three of the nearest stars. So they may say, think that we're like this, but I always thought that was cool. So on the same day, back to our story, June 27th, Captain E.B. Detchmendy reported to his commanding officer that he saw a white glowing UFO pass over the missile range. <coughs> And on June 29th, rocket expert C.J. Zone and three of his technicians who were also at White Sands watched a giant silver disc moving northward over the desert. And then July 2nd, 1947, a UFO was tracked at three separate installations at Alamogordo, White Sands, and Roswell. Now, on July 2nd, a UFO was tracked at three separate installations, as I said, White Sands, Roswell, Alamogordo. And the same day, Mr. and Mrs. Dan Wilmot saw a UFO from their front porch. That's Dan right there. They reported its appearance as two inverted saucers facing mouth to mouth, moving at a high rate of speed over their house. In the Roswell Daily Record on July 8, 1947, and we'll get to that in a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Dan Wilmot gave their account of their encounter of a flying disc on the evening of July 2nd at 10 minutes of 10 p.m. Wilmot said that it appeared to him to be about 1,500 feet high and going fast. He estimated the speed between 400 and 500 miles per hour. So, I'm just gonna admit something here. 
In appearance, it looked oval in shape like two inverted saucers faced mouth to mouth, or like he said, two old type wash bowls placed together in the same fashion. And from where he stood, Wilmot said that the object looked to be about five feet in size and making an allowance for the distance it was from the town, he figured that it must have been 15 to 20 feet in diameter. The entire body glowed as though light were showing through from the inside, almost opaque like. Though not like it would inside, though not like it would be if light were merely underneath. He's saying it was opaque in nature. The object came into view from the southeast, disappeared over the treetops in the general vicinity, vicinity of Six Mile Hill outside of Roswell. And the announcement that the Roswell Army Air Force, that's what that RAAF stands for, was in possession of a flying saucer came only a few minutes after he decided to release the details of what he had seen. So there's a fact. There were objects seen flying at incredible speeds across the skies of both the Pacific Northwest and the American Southwest in late June and early July of 1947, independent of the Roswell event. And these flying objects that were observed could not be identified. The uh, Army Air Force didn't know what they were. Let's get into the Roswell story now. Mac Brazel, William W. W. Mac Brazel was a stereotypical cowboy, although he actually tended sheep. He sold wool. See him on the horse there. This is the famous uh, cabin where they'll be staying and central to our story. And he was foreman of the Foster Ranch in rural Lincoln County, in uh, near Corona, New Mexico. <clears throat> he was married with children, but his wife and kids lived in Tularosa, New Mexico, near Alamogordo, so the kids would be near a good school, while he mostly lived in an old house out on the ranch where he worked. And there he is with his wife. And from all accounts, he was happy with his life, riding the range, tending the sheep, shearing the sheep, and selling the wool. That's how he made a living. And pictures from that time show a man who might have stepped out of an old Roy Rogers movie. He was a real cowboy. He was the type who would tip his hat and say, howdy, ma'am, whenever he passed a lady in the street. <clears throat> so on the evening of July 2nd or July 4th, various sources disagree, there was a severe thunderstorm in the area with lots of lightning. I was there 50 years after the event in Roswell in a camper on July 4th, 1997, and I saw the most ferocious lightning storm I've ever seen in my life and the loudest thunder. Boy, does it, it, the sky was lit up for hours. So I know what a New Mexico thunderstorm in the middle of the summer looks like. So Mac offered wondered why light, lightning struck the ground repeatedly in the same spots on the ranch. In fact, the area where he's about to go to. And he wondered if it meant that maybe there were metal deposits underground at those spots. And he probably considered to do some prospecting and mining in the area later on. But there was something different amongst these booming thunderclaps, according to Mac. He later said it sounded like an explosion. Two of Mac's children were staying with him at the ranch house that night, as they often did. And they later recalled that they didn't uh, notice the sound, the different sound. Okay. <clears throat> so the next morning, either July 3rd or July 5th, Mac rode out as usual to check on his sheep. They were on the range, grazing, looking for water, and ride the fences, looking for any holes in the fences that he'd have to patch. He was accompanied by a seven-year-old neighbor boy, William D. Proctor. There's some confusion as to who was with him that day, too, even with the original story. So riding south of the ranch, they came suddenly upon an area about a quarter of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. It was strewn with debris, shiny bits and pieces unlike anything Mac had ever seen. And you'll see different melted alloys in the photos here. The sheep, though, refused to cross the debris, and they had to be herded the long way around to get to water. And Mac was upset. He was leasing this land. Who's going to pick this stuff up? So he picked up some of the material, carried it with him back to the ranch headquarters, and he put it in a shed. Okay? Some material in that shed. And by the way, that's still standing today, that iconic shed. So Bessie Brazel Scheiber, Mac's daughter, said, there was what appeared to be pieces of heavily waxed paper and a sort of aluminum-like foil. 
Some of these pieces had something like numbers and lettering on them, but there were no words you were able to make out. You see a photograph there, right-hand corner. That's an I-beam I'll be referring to. Uh, Jesse Ra uh, Marcel Jr., who appears later in the story, will discuss that, but you'll see that from time to time. Bessie goes on. She says, some of the metal foil pieces had a sort of tape stuck to them. And when these were held to the light, they showed what looked like pastel flowers or designs. Even though the stuff looked like tape, it could not be peeled off or removed at all. The writing looked like numbers mostly, at least I assume them to be numbers. They were written out like you would write numbers in a column to do an addition problem, but they didn't look like the numbers we used at all. These are some actual drawings of um, Jesse Marcel Jr. of what these icons looked like, these symbols on the I-beam. What gave me the idea they were numbers, I guess, was the way they were all ranged out in columns. No, it definitely was not a balloon. We had seen weather balloons quite a lot, both on the ground and in the air. Uh, balloons were being released from the White Sands Proving Grounds. We even found a couple of Japanese style balloons that had come down in the area once. Now she's talking about Japanese balloon bombs. Late in the 1944, the Japanese began launching balloon bombs up into the uh, upper atmosphere. They had discovered the jet stream and they thought if they, they could send um, uh, these uh, balloons with explosives on them and, and also incendiary devices, they could start forest fires. And uh, it was top secret. They launched over 10,000. Um, one of them killed a family of six in Oregon, I believe. Uh, somebody pulled a cord on one of the, the balloons and it blew up. Um, the 555th uh, Infantry Parachute Battalion, the Triple Nickels, the only African-American regiment in World War II. Actually, they were called smoke jumpers. They were had a top secret uh, assignment uh, to put out the forest fires in the Northwest that were being set by the Japanese, but we, the Japanese never found out that these balloons were working. Back to our story. Okay. So she also says, Becky goes on, we also had picked up a couple of those thin rubber weather balloons with instrument packages. So she's saying they know what weather balloons are, even as a little girl. And this was nothing like that. And I've never ever seen anything resembling this sort of thing before or since. So, now let's talk about Project Mogul. Okay, back to 1947, Cold War is heating up. We did not know where the Russians were uh, um, performing nuclear uh, detonations in the Soviet Union. The only photographs we heard, had were old Luftwaffe photographs taken of Russia. It wouldn't be, be until the U-2 spy plane actually flew over Russia where we knew what they were doing. Uh, east of the Ural Mountains. But Project Mogul was a top secret project by the U.S. Army Air Force involving microphones flown at high on high altitude balloons whose primary purpose was long distance detection of sound waves generated by Soviet atomic bomb tests. That's real. It happened and there was a Project Mogul. It was carried out from 1947 until early 1949. It was moderately successful, but was very expensive. Now here's where it gets murky. Some people claim that Project Mogul didn't begin until August of 47 after the Roswell incident. So my question is if, if it was a balloon, and this is, again, it depends on what day of the week is, if I think this is from outer space or it was one of ours, but where were the sensitive attached listening devices? You're not gonna hear that in any of the descriptions of the debris. Where were the radios they need? They couldn't have them the size of a cell phone. It, they had to be huge box radios. And also where were the antenna they'd need to transmit the information back from those radios, the, the uh, information that they were hearing from Soviet uh, nuclear detonations. And there had to be long discernible balloon cords. None of these show up in the description. <clears throat> so, Back to Mac Brassel, we heard from his daughter. Later that day, he put a small piece of debris in his pocket when he drove <clears throat> the seven-year-old Deep Proctor to his home about 10 miles away from the ranch headquarters. When I'm talking ranch headquarters, I'm talking about the ranch shack. It's a cottage. And he showed the debris to Dee's parents, William and Loretta Proctor, and tried to get them to go, hey, go back out and look, with, uh, look at the debris field with me. And back then, they said, uh, Floyd Proctor said that Mac, he said it wasn't paper because he couldn't cut it with his knife and the metal was different from anything he'd ever seen. He said the designs looked like the kind of stuff you would find on firecracker wrappers, some sort of figures all done up in pastels, but not writing like we would do it. Loretta Proctor, photographed here, 
The piece he brought looked like a kind of tan, light brown plastic. It was very lightweight, like balsa wood. It wasn't a large piece, maybe about four inches long, maybe just larger than a pencil. And we'd cut on it with a knife, and we'd hold a match on it, and it wouldn't burn. We knew it wasn't wood. It was smooth like plastic. It didn't have real sharp corners, kind of like a dowel stick, kind of dark tan. It didn't have any grain, just smooth. We should have gone to look at the debris field, but gas and tires, they were expensive then. We had our own chores to do and it would be, have been 20 miles. The next night, July 5th, Mac goes into Corona, New Mexico, where he told his uncle, Hollis Wilson, about the debris. He showed fragments to local residents in the local bar, the hardware store, and elsewhere. Anybody would listen to him. Hey, look at this. Look what I found. And then Wilson and another man who was present told Mac about the flying saucers that were being reported around the area. And he advised him to report his find to the authorities. Mac didn't, Mac didn't know anything about these flying saucers. He didn't read the paper. So on July 6th, Mac went into town. He said, I'd better go into town and report this to someone. And he stopped off first at the office of Chavez County Sheriff George Wilcox right there in the right. At first, Wilcox paid little attention, but when Mac showed him a piece of the debris, he realized that this might be important. So Wilcox called Roswell Army Airfield, and he spoke to Major Jesse A. Marcel, the base intelligence officer, who was on a lunch break when he received the call. That's Jesse Marcel, right-hand corner. So Wilcox informed him that rancher Mac Brassel had found debris from a crash of some sort of object on a sheep ranch. Marcel told Wilcox he would come into Roswell and talk to Brazel. That's the Roswell Army Air Force Base, circa 1947. So Major Jesse A. Marcel, the intelligence officer at Roswell Army Air Force Base, this was the home of the only bomb group in existence at the time with the atomic bomb. All of the personnel at the base had high security clearance. It was the home of the 509th Bombardment Group, the only atomic bomb wing in the United States at the time. And they had dropped the atomic bombs on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. So Marcel was a veteran and trusted officer who had been a highly skilled cartographer, and he was sent to intelligence training by the Army because of his impeccable character. Now, he had logged over 450 hours of combat duty as a pilot during the war. There's some debate about that, if he was an actual combat pi pilot or, or not. And he was highly decorated with five air medals for shooting down enemy aircraft. Again, there's more speculation that perhaps Marcel might have embellished his military record. After the war ended, he was chosen as a member of the 509th Bomber Wing Handling Security for Operation Crossroads, which conducted nuclear testing in 1946. So to reiterate this, he's essentially chosen as a member um, for Operation Crossroads, which is taking data from the Project Mogul operation. So if he were a buffoon and misidentified uh, the wrong type of uh, uh, debris and called it a balloon, he got promoted um, for his incompetency. And it was a highly sophisticated, uh, highly secretive operation, Operation Crossroads. They were listening to the Soviets. So he was awarded a commendation for his work on the nuclear project and he was named the intelligence officer for Roswell Army Air Force Base. He went to town, talked about Brazel. Brazel showed him a piece of his debris, and he reported his findings to his CO, Colonel Butch Blanchard. Blanchard immediately sent Marcel uh, to go to the site, and he was to be accomp accompanied by an Army Counterintelligence Corps officer by the name of Sheridan Cavett. That's Butch Blanchard. So, Blanchard is key to our story, by the way, lower right-hand corner. So Marcel took out his old Buick, and Cavett accompanied him in a Jeep all-terrain vehicle. And following Marcel back to the ranch, it was too late that day to visit the site, so they all, all three of them stayed in Max Ranch cabin. And after a dinner of beans, the three headed to the site the very next morning. And after a brief look around, Mac left. He had chores to do, and Marcel and Cavett went out to the debris field. 
So they arrived too late that night for ample light for a decent search. And so the soldiers spent the night there and now they're moving off to the alleged debris field. And this is a photo, by the way, of the alleged debris field. Cheshire Marcel says, when we arrived at the crash site, it was amazing to see the vast amount of area that it covered. It was a gouge. Now again, something heavy and moving quickly to form that gouge, something as light as a weather balloon. He said, it's scattered over an area about three quarters of a mile long, I would say, and fairly wide, several hundred feet wide. It was definitely not a weather or tracking device, nor was it any sort of plane or missile. Remember that, and this guy's highly qualified. I didn't know what it was, but it certainly wasn't anything built by us, and it certainly wasn't any weather balloon. There were small beams about three eighths or a half inch square with some sort of hieroglyphics on them that nobody could decipher. We keep seeing that, the hieroglyphics. There you go. These looked like, looked something like balsa wood and were about the same weight, except they were not wood at all. They were very hard, although flexible, it would not burn at all. There was a great deal of an unusual parchment-like substance, which was brown in color and extremely strong, and a great number of small pieces of a metal-like tinfoil, except that it wasn't tinfoil. I was interested in electronics and kept looking for something that resembled instruments or electronic equipment, but I didn't find anything. There you go. If it was Project Mogul, he should have found that. Cavett, I think, found a black metallic looking box several inches square. Ooh, here we go. As there was no apparent way to open this, and since it didn't appear to be an instrument package of any sort, we threw it in with the rest of the stuff. It had little numbers with symbols that we had to call hieroglyphics because I could not understand them. They were pink and purple, and they looked like they were painted on. So he's corroborating, corroborating everything that Mac's daughter, Bessie, has said up to this point. I even took my cigarette lighter and tried to burn the material we found that resembled parchment and balsa, but it would not burn, wouldn't even smoke. The pieces of metal that we brought back were so thin, just like the tin foil on a pack of cigarettes. You could not tear or cut it, and we even tried making a dent in it with a 16-pound sledgehammer, and there was still no dent in it. Having rode to the site in two vehicles now, Marcel sent Cavett back to the base with his Jeep full of the material. Marcel then took his old Buick and stopped by his house in the early hours on the way to Roswell base on Tuesday, July 8th. He shows his wife and his son, Jesse Marcel Jr. his amazing find. I had a long conversation a couple of times with Jesse Marcel Jr. Seemed like a decent, only the facts type of guy, and his story has never wavered. Remember that, Jesse Marcel Sr., he passed away a few years ago. So, I'm sorry, Jesse Mar Marcel Jr. So Jesse Jr. just passed away. He handles the debris as, as his dad scattered the debris out on the kitchen table. And he said the material was foil-like stuff, very thin, metallic-like, but not metal, and very tough. That's Jesse Marcel Jr. in the right-hand corner. There was also some structural-like material too, beams and so on. He was the one that designed the I-beam through his recollections. Also a quality of black plastic material which looked organic in nature. Imprinted along the edge of some of the beam remnants were hieroglyphic type characters. Jesse Jr. labeled the debris into three categories. First, a metallic gray foil-like substance. Second, plastic-like material that was similar to Bakelite and brownish black in color. And third, eye beams. If you hold the beam at an end, you can see the letter I, that contained purple hieroglyphics. Marcel described returning to Roswell the evening of July 7th, actually in the morning of the 8th, to find that news of the incident had been leaked. So the only way, the only people that could have told him of that is that Mac went back into town, which we have no record of. He might have, though, <clears throat> to tell people that there are two guys out examining the debris field or <clears throat> the counterintelligence guy ran his mouth, Sheridan Cabot. He went back and blabbed to the base. And maybe he had let the word get out before even Blanchard was on duty that morning. So calls were made to Marcel's house and he had a visit from a reporter, but he wouldn't confirm the reports to the press. 
good intelligence officer. He said, the next morning, that written press release went out, and after that, things really hit the fan. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So word of the goings-on began to spread rapidly in the community, and soon Mac Brazel was talking to radio station KGFL about the incident after Frank Joyce spoke with Sheriff Wilcox asking for any news of the day. The radio stations in town go to the sheriff. What do you got? Any arrests? Any fires? Any... And this came up. So Mac told the station what he knew over the telephone. And that's Frank Joyce on the right. So radio station KGFL reporter Frank Joyce then informs his boss, Walt Whitmore Sr., about the recent developments. And Whit Whitmore drove out and picked up Brazel and took him to his home in Roswell to hide him out. So Mac spent the night at Whitmore's home. And there an, an interview took place, all taped into a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, but this interview would never be made public. The next morning, Whitmore took Mac down to KGFL and he called the base. When Marcel arrived back at the base in the early morning, he was instructed by Colonel Butch Blanchard to load the debris on a B-29 and fly it to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, today known as Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And stopping on the way though, he was gonna see uh, Blanchard's commanding officer, General Ramey, at Carswell Army Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas. So there's Blanchard. And they loaded up in a B-29. Walter Houtnow, the press information officer, was given an order from Colonel Blanchard to write a press release stating that the RAAF, Roswell Army Air Force, had in its possession a crashed saucer. Here's my speculation. Uh, Walter Hout was a good press secretary. He said that, told me, and I talked to him a few times in person. He's passed uh, since then. That Blanchard would mumble things to him with a cigar sometime in his mouth, saying, put out an, uh, a press release. We're going to have uh, the band, the Army band's going to play in town today. Or, or there's a special uh, a couple of uh, fighter planes that are landing on the base. Put out a press release. And he might have said something to the, hey, we sent two guys out to look up for this, uh, to look for this debris of a flash, uh, crash flying saucer. I guess a rancher found it, stored some of the debris. So put out a press release and he probably walked away, leaving um, Walter Hout to embellish it. Like a kid's game of telephone. The phone started ringing off the hook and with every telling, um, you know, the story got grander and grander and, 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 and twisted. And then when other reporters called back a second time, they needed something new from the first statement. So Walter Hout was drummed out of the Army Air Force uh, the following year in 1948, where everybody else involved in this incident was promoted. He was booted for all intent and purpose, driven out. So here we go. That's Walter Hout on the left. He was kind of made the scapegoat of all this, but he was just doing what his CO told him, and his CO probably just mumbled a quick couple of sentences to him, and he had to build the professional press release around it. You blame him. Hout said that the saucer was transported to the 8th Air Force to be turned over to General Ramey uh, at Carswell Army Airfield in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's General Ramey on the right there next to Butch Colonel Blanchard. So Hout discharged his duty, finishes the press release he'd been ordered to write. He was ordered to write this, gave copies of the release to the two radio stations and both of the newspapers. Now, I asked him twice in two different years if, Colonel Blanchard proofread this. He said once he said, yes, for sure. Then the other thing he says, I think so. So then the headlines hit the newspapers. 509th Bomb Group, the most secretive air wing in all the world, is on the front pages. RAAF, Roswell Army Air Force, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Captures flying saucer. No details of flying disc are revealed. Hout's statement, here we go, I'm gonna read it verbatim. The many rumors regarding the flying disks became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Atomic Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disk through the cooperation of one of the ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. I didn't mention any disk here. Nobody at to this point mentioned any sort of disk. So he was, told that by his CO, Butch Blanchard. The flying object landed, landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Well, you know, we found debris. It looks like there was a crash, not didn't land. There's Jesse Marcel again. Not having phone facilities, the rancher stored the disc. He stored some debris 
until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Walter, you shouldn't be saying that you have a spook going out into the field. Action was immediately taken and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. No, it wasn't. The debris was trucked in by Cabot and uh, Jesse Marcel. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Jesse Marcel to hire headquarters. It's, what is, it's my flying saucer. Okay, I'll loan it to you, but you better give it back. <laughs> The rancher's name and the location of his place was withheld. Okay, so they're not saying Mac Brassel's name, but Walter gives away the, uh, the spy, Jesse Marcel, prints his name out. Then the second radio station in Roswell, George Walsh of the radio station KSWS, which provided first news of the announcement, okay, said only Major Marcel, Colonel W.H. Blanchard, commanding officer at Roswell, and the rancher had seen the object. So... You're saying Butch Blanchard had seen it, Marcel, and Mac Brassel. The sheriff, uh, I'll just move this here. Walsh reported upon receiving word from the rancher, went immediately to the intelligence officer at Roswell Army Airfield. <clears throat> now I'm going to read you the headline that was printed, okay, in the Roswell Daily Record, Tuesday, July 8th, 1947, that went in today's terms viral around the world. RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. No details of flying disc are revealed. Roswell hardware man and wife report disc scene. That's back to Dan Wilmot, the July 2nd sighting. All these sightings are coming in at once. Here we go. The intelligence office of the 509th bomb bombardment group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. According to information released by the Department over authority of Major J.A. Marcel, intelligence officer, the disc was recovered on a ranch in the Roswell vicinity after an unidentified rancher had notified Sheriff George Wilcox here that he had found the instrument on his premises. Instrument. Major Marcel, this is being written again by Walter Hout, the PIO, Press Information Officer. Major Marcel, in a detail from his department, went to the ranch and recovered the disc they recovered debris, it was stated. After the intelligence officer here had inspected the instrument, it was flown to higher headquarters. The intelligence office stated that no details of the saucer's construction or its appearance had been revealed. So it makes papers all across the world. Army reveals it as flying disc found on ranch in New Mexico. Captures flying saucer on ranch. Sorry, that's fake news. They didn't capture flying saucer, they found debris. Now I'm going to go to a, um, a radio broadcast. And before I do that, Taylor Grant mentions it here. And, and you can see, let me just go back here. This X is where the debris field is, OK? Um, now, I was at Roswell in 95, my first of three trips. And they had this huge Bureau of Land Management map on the wall. And I'm looking around, where's the debris field? Because nobody could tell me where the debris field was. And I saw this tiny X marked in a pencil. Called one of the guys over. He says, oh, well, my buddy's a surveyor. Let's go out tomorrow morning and look at it. So he, we went out with his wife, a surveyor, and we found the area. And then subsequently, the press would find it in 96, 97. I'm not saying that I found the debris field, but he showed me the area where the X was. And eventually, some of the photographs that came forward, we were out there. So let's play this now. I'm just going to go. Uh, to the web for one moment. I'm going to be playing you the press report as it was broadcast on the radio uh, across the nation. In fact, a, a, a British um, man claimed that he was a salesman driving across the desert. He heard this live, and a lot of people did. Here we go. And I'm going to bring go back to my, um, my report. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. The American Broadcasting Company and affiliated stations present Headline Edition with Taylor Grant. From all over the world, wherever the day's headlines are made, Headline Edition brings you accurate, timely reports on the news behind those headlines, plus informative in-person interviews with the men and women who made the headlines today. Today's edition presents a roundup of the latest developments in the finding of a flying disc. 
stay in step with history in the making. Stay tuned to Headline Edition. Now, here's Taylor Grant. This afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange disks had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the disks which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disk landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disk looked like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying saucers to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box type. He says that it was so battered that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tinfoil. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. The disc also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. So that's the actual report. The disc landed, did it? Phones rang off the hook at Roswell Army Airfield. Press officer Walter Hout was inundated. Okay, and if we could just mute those. So. Okay, I'm just. I'm sorry. We're having we're having an issue here. It sounds like Joe Rogan. It is Joe Rogan. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. I thought there was somebody coming in. All right, that's the Buffalo. Sorry, I'm sorry, folks. Back to our story. Here we go. So phones rang off the hook at the Roswell Army Airfield as the press officer Walter Hout was inundated. The phones rang at the radio stations at KGFL, all over the world, from as far away as Asia, Japan, and it was at that point that the military decided to quote walk the story back. Okay. Walt Whitmore Sr. said threats from the military would prevent the transmission of the tape that he made with Mac Brazel by KGFL. And the next day, Whitmore took Brazel to the radio station and called the Roswell Army base. But what Whitmore told the base is not known exactly, but the military came and picked Mac up and transported him to the base where he was, quote, a guest of sorts for about a week. He was held captive. Mac Brazel was seen escorted by military personnel and spent some time in military custody where he said he was intimidated into not talking about what he had seen, according to several witnesses. For example, and this is uh, Edwin Easley, Provo Marshal Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Easley admitted to researcher Kevin Randall that they held Brazel at the base for several days. And Lydia Sleppy, she was a teletype operator working at an Albuquerque radio station in 1947. She said they received a telephone call from Johnny McBoyle of KSWS Radio in Roswell, their competitor. And in her affidavit, she recalled Johnny McBoyle saying, there's been one of those flying saucer things crashed down here north of Roswell. He said he'd met Brazel in a coffee shop and Brazel said he discovered the object and quote, had it towed underneath a shelter on his property. So this radio guy is now, the, the, the story now takes a left turn here. Brazel offered to take McBoyle to the ranch to see the object. This is according to the radio guy. McBoyle described it as being a big crumpled dishpan. So we don't know if he actually visited the site or if that's Mac's description. This sequence does not fit the Roswell narrative. She added that the FBI then interrupted the teletype as she was trying to send it and ordered that they cease transmission. She said her boss, Carl Lambert, spoke to Johnny McBoyle the next day, and he told Mr. Lambert's 
It's according to Lydia Sleppy. The military had isolated the area where the saucer was found and was keeping the press out. He saw planes come in from right field, Ohio, to take the thing away. So that's another twist in the story. They had plenty of B-29s at Roswell Army Airfield. Uh, there was not one flown in specifically from right field to fly it to Fort Worth, then on to right field. The station owner, Merle Tucker, confirmed hearing the story at the time, and in an interview shortly before his death, Johnny McBoyle confirmed seeing an object. Okay, so he claims he was, again, a deathbed confession of Roswell. But he said he saw an object that looked like a crushed dish, dish pan about 25 to 30 feet long, impacted in a slope. There you go. It brings us to a second now crash site. And that's where all the people come out, uh, the Frank Coffins, the Jim Ragsdale, that say they, were, they saw this second site. Frank Joyce now, news announcer at KGFL, said he spoke to Brazel by telephone when he first came to town. And Brazel described finding non-human bodies. Huh? This went from debris now to a set, another crash site with, with humanoids. Later, Joyce received the, breast, the base press release announcing the recovery of a flying disc and put it on the United Press teletype. When the first UP bulletins came in on the station teletype, Joyce said the phones went crazy. Then he received an irate call from a Colonel Johnson at the Pentagon demanding to know who had told him to issue the press release. Joyce said he was a civilian and couldn't be ordered around like that, to which the Colonel responded, I'll show you what I can do to you. So, just, uh, somebody's in the waiting room here. Let me just get this off the screen. Okay. So, Joyce said, that he decided to uh, release the press co uh, the the copy of the press release and and uh, he also hid other copies of the press release that came over over the wire so he could later prove to his boss Whitmore that he hadn't made made any of these stories up and later somebody he says came through the station and found some of the hidden material and removed it however some of the original teletypes were not found and Joyce still has them so he's saying some other secret. Uh, transmissions were taken by somebody who came in and really raked the office and Joyce has the original teletypes as anybody in the radio station would. Judd Dixon of the United Press in Santa Fe, New Mexico said the same thing happened in his office. George Judd Roberts was manager of the radio station KGFL in Roswell and he signed an affidavit where he claimed to have been threatened if he ran an interview with, that his station had done with Mac Brazel. I got a call from someone in Washington, D.C. It might have been someone in the office of New Mexico Senators Clinton Anderson or Dennis Chavez. And this person said, we understand that you have some information and we want to assure you that if you release it, it's very possible that your station's license will be in jeopardy. So we suggest that you not do it. The person indicated that we might lose our license in as quickly as three days, and I made the decision not to release the story. Walt Whitmore Jr. now, the son of the KGFL station owner, also recalled how his father had hidden Brazel at their home and done a recorded interview. Whitmore Sr. was unable to get the story through on the mutual wire and instead began broadcasting a preliminary release locally over KGFL. And at this point, a long distance phone call came to the station from a man named Slowey saying he was with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC in Washington. Slowly informed Whitmore that the story involved national security, he invokes that term, and that if he valued his station license, he should cease transmitting it and forget about it. Project Mogul, top secret. My question is how, if he started broadcasting this on his local station, how did it get all the way to Washington, D.C.? Answer probably is somebody heard it at the Roswell base and phoned their superiors. So immediately afterwards, another call from Washington came from Senator Dennis Chavez, who suggested he'd better do what Slowey advised from the FCC. Frank Joyce, Roswell Radio, Radio KGFL news announcer, said he spoke to Brazel when he first reported the incident to Sheriff Wilcox. In earlier interviews, Joyce wouldn't discuss the details of what Brazel told him, saying only that he didn't believe the story, but suggested he report the incident to the base. After Brazel gave his press interview, he called Joyce again and said, we haven't got the story right. And that's my, huh, Scooby, huh? Brazel's military escorts then led him out to a car and drove him to KGFL. 
People who saw him leave the newspaper office said he kept his head down and pretended not to see any of his friends. At KGFL, he was allowed to go in alone while his escorts waited outside, listening on the radio. Brasso went into the radio station and told Joyce a balloon story. Joyce responded, look, this is completely different than what you told me on the phone the other day about the little green men. Joyce said Brazel responded to the effect, no, they weren't green and our lives will never be the same again. Joyce explained this cryptic conversation by, by saying that Brazel first mentioned small non-human beings when he first spoke with them. Initially, Brazel was highly stressed over the large quantities of debris that needed to be cleaned up. I apologize for the swear, I won't say it, but who's going to clean all this bleep up? Then Joyce said Brazel really began losing it, talking about the horrible stretch from the dead little people he had found at another location. The story takes a turn here. Joyce suggested that maybe he found monkeys from a military experiment. They're not monkeys and they're not human. Joyce then went on to explain that his little green men comment referred back to our original phone conversation, the first uh, talk that he had with Mac. So Frank Joyce said the story that Brazel told him after the news conference that Brazel appeared at was different from the original story he had told Joyce when Brazel first reported it to Sheriff Wilcox. Joyce says, I remember him changing the story. I told him, what you're saying is not what you were saying the other night. <coughs> he admitted that he had been told to come in or else. He told me what they were going to do to us. He was really scared. Brazel said, you're not going to tell them anything, are you? Joyce promised he wouldn't. Brazel said he had to tell the new story or it would go hard on him. Brazel's son, Bill, and various neighbors said Brazel also complained bitterly about his treatment by the military afterwards. On July 8th, Mack was escorted by the military to the offices of the Roswell Daily Record, where he gave a press interview. The story he told them was a bit different from what he had told before, however. Now, he said that he and his son, not Dee Proctor, the neighbor, had originally discovered the debris on June 14th. This is 10 days before the Kenneth Arnold sighting over Mount Rainier, but he, that he was in such a hurry that he ignored it. So the debris scattered across the field, your sheep can't water and he ignores it. Mac Brazel died in 1963, well before researchers started to interview in witnesses to the incident. This incident, until it uh, shows up in uh, uh, Unsolved Mysteries in uh, Stanton Friedman, interviewed Jesse Marcel in 1978. So the Roswell story stays dormant for 31 years before Stanton Friedman begins to, begins to uncover. And uh, Brasso was interviewed in 1947, however, and his accounts of debris appeared in the Roswell Daily Record on July 9th, 1947. This is when they walk it back. Harassed rancher who located Saucer, sorry he told about it. I'll read it. W.W. Brazel, 48, Lincoln County rancher living 30 miles southeast of Corona today told the story of finding what the Army at first described as a flying disc, but the publicity which attended his find caused him to add that if he ever found anything short of a bomb, he sure wasn't going to say anything about it. Brazel was brought here late yesterday by W.E. Whitmore of radio station KGFL, had his picture taken and gave an interview to the record and Jason Cl uh, Kellahan sent here from the Albuquerque Bureau of the Associated Press to cover the story. The picture he posed for was sent out over the AP telephoto wire sending machine, specially set up in the record office by R.D. Adair, AP wire chief, sent here for the sole purpose of getting out the picture and that of Sheriff George Wilcox, to whom Brazel originally gave the information of his find. Brazel related that on June 14th, he and the eight-year-old son Vernon, and I think Brazel is trying to protect his, uh, his neighbor here, we're about seven or eight miles from the ranch house of J.B. Foster Ranch, which he operates, when they came upon a large area of bright wreckage made up on rubber strips, tin foil, or rather tough paper and sticks. So he's talking about the debris that was found. At the time, Brazel was in a hurry to get his round made, and he did not pay much attention to it. But he did remark about what he had seen, and on July 4th, he, his wife, Vernon, and a daughter, Betty, age 14, went back to the spot and gathered up quite a bit of the debris. So now he's saying his wife Vernon's with him and his daughter. The next day he first heard about the flying discs and he wondered if what he had found might be the remnants of one of these. 
So Monday, he came to town to, to sell some wool. And while here, he went to see Sheriff George Wilcox and whispered kind of confidential-like that he might have found a flying disc. Wilcox got in touch with the Roswell Army Airfield and Major Jesse A. Marcel and a man in plain clothes accompanied him home where they picked up the rest of the pieces of the disc and went to his home to try to reconstruct it. Again, a new story. According to Brazel, they simply could not reconstruct it at all. They tried to make a kite out of it, but could not do that and could not find any way to put it back together so that it would fit. Then Major Marcel brought it to the Roswell, brought it to Roswell, and that, that was the last he heard of it until the story broke that he had found a flying disc. So he's totally walked back the story. Brazel said that he did not see it fall from the sky and did not see it before it was torn up, so he did not know the size or shape it might have been but he thought it might have been about as large as a tabletop. The balloon which held it up, if that was how it worked, must have been about 12 feet long, he felt, measuring the distance by the size of the room in which he sat. The rubber was smoky gray in color and scattered over an area 200 yards in diameter. When the debris was gathered up, the tinfoil, paper, tape, and sticks made a bundle about three feet long and seven or eight inches thick, while the rubber made a bundle about 18 or 20 inches long and about eight inches thick. <clears throat> in all, he estimated the entire lot would have weighed maybe five pounds. That's nothing. There was no sign of any metal in the area, which might have been used for an engine, and no sign of any propellers of any kind, although at least one paper fin had been glued onto some of the tinfoil. Oh, oh. And there's uh, Mac in his old age. There were no words to be found anywhere on the instrument, although there were letters of, on some of the parts. Considerable scotch tape, and some tape with flowers printed upon it had been used in the construction. No strings or wire were to be found, but there were some eyelets in the paper to indicate that some sort of attachment may have been used. Brazel said that he had previously found two weather balloons on the ranch, but that what he found this time did not in any way resemble either of these. I am sure what I found was not any weather observation balloon, he said. But if I find anything else besides a bomb, they're going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it. So Bessie, Brazel's daughter, helped recover the debris, which she described to be similar to aluminum and wax paper, and it had indescribable writings on it. And her 1995 affidavit was published and included additional descriptions. She claimed the pieces now looked like a weather balloon. The pieces of the debris had two parts. The, foil was foil, the front was foil-like, and the other was rubber-like, both of which were gray in color. She said it was tan before. The debris had sticks attached to them with white tape. His son, Bill, confirmed what Bessie said by claiming there was tinfoil-like material in wood with Japanese or Chinese figures. Is this now going back to one of those Japanese balloon bonds? The wood was similar to balsa wood, but it could not be cut or broken. However, when interviewed in 1994, Sheridan Cabot, the Roswell Counterintelligence Corps CIC officer identified by Jesse Marcel as assisting him in investigating the crash and recovering debris said he had no memory whatsoever of ever meeting Brazel or going out with Marcel. He claimed, however, he did go to the crash site with his CIC assistant, Sergeant Lewis Rickett. Cabot described the crash site as 20 square feet contained bamboo sticks and reflective materials similar to aluminum. 20 square feet, that's nothing. It's 10 by two feet. I just don't believe Cabot. Rickett said he and Cabot traveled to it the following day where an extensive cleanup was in progress. So it looks like Cabot's substituted Marcel in the story for Rickett. He and disavows any knowledge of Marcel. And we know that Marcel was there. The participants in the cleanup were guarded by MPs and Rickett held a six inch by 12 inch piece of debris that was unbreakable. Rickett said he had witnessed high security and a large military debris recovery, handled strange metal debris and saw a gouge in the ground. And in September, 1947, Rickett said he and Cavett assisted an astronomer, Dr. Lincoln La Paz, who shows up in so many UFO stories, to try to determine the speed and trajectory of the device that crashed on the Brazel Ranch. According to Rickett, La Paz informed the opinion that the object was a probe from another planet. That's the depiction there. Looks similar to what Kenneth Arnold drew at the top of our story. Rickett said they found a touchdown point five miles from the debris field where the stand had crystallized, possibly from the heat. And shortly before he died, it is also claimed that he confirmed the object's shape was long, thin, with a bat-like wing. 
again, the debris field and the crash site, two different areas. So Marcel lands in Carswell, um, Army Air Force Base, Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Brigadier General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, takes over. He's upset that all of this exposure to the 509th and on every front page of the newspaper, what are you guys doing? So the debris is taken to Ramey's office and spread out on brown paper. Now, Marcel said later that one photo was taken of him with the real debris. Then Ramey took him into another room. And when he came back, a weather balloon had been substituted for the actual debris. Now, there's some speculation that William Moore, the author of the first Roswell book in 1980, made this story up. But let's go on. That's Jesse holding the material in the office. Certainly looks like everything we've discussed, tinfoil-like. Okay. It's spread out on brown paper. Okay. Again, there's the other picture. Still another, just showing the debris. There are the I-beams, the tin foil. I mean, it looks like a target, a raw one target. So a weather officer, warrant or officer Irving Newton was brought in and he immediately identified the material he saw as a weather balloon and a raw wind radar tar target. Now, this might lend credence to the swap story. And here's General Ramey. And look, he's on the left. And look what's in his hand. He's got some sort of teletype message. We're going to go into that in just a sec. So they're desperate to walk back this story to get the press off their backs. A raw one radar target was a reflector made of metal foil and balsa wood sticks that was attached to a weather balloon so it could be tracked on radar. Here's Ramey. Here are the pictures of Ramey. So Newton was a weather forecaster at Fort Worth, Texas. He was identified in contemporary accounts as being brought in to make an official weather balloon identification on behalf of General Ramey. And again, look at that memo in Ramey's left hand as he kneels down. Same material we've seen in the other photos. So in his original testimony, uh, Newton indicated that when he got to Ramey's office, he was told it was a weather balloon. In a later affidavit for the Air Force, he was convinced it was a balloon and remained convinced there were figures on the sticks, which he, which looked to be weather faded markings. There's Newton to the right. Now, two witnesses, J. Bond Johnson, pictured here, a reporter and photographer for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, he took six photographs of the debris, which he described as aluminum, balsa wood, and burnt rubber. In 1978, when Marcel brought the story to the attention of Stanton Friedman. He said, the stuff in that one photo was pieces of the actual stuff we found. It was not a stage photo. Later, they cleared out our wreckage and substituted some of their own. Then they allowed more photos. The, those photos were taken while the actual wreckage was on its way to right field. That photo of Ramey with weather balloon, that's a fake. What you see there is nothing but a piece of brown paper that I put over the real debris so that the news media couldn't get a picture of what I had. So there's a contradiction. He's Marcel saying they swapped the debris, removed it. Now he's saying they covered it with brown paper and brought out the weather balloon. I, and he just mentioned, he said the stuff was already on its way to right field. Doesn't make any sense. I covered the real stuff, including in the photo of me, you are showing. Ramey told me, just don't show anything. Don't show anything. So there's brown paper underneath that. And he says, that's where the real debris is. Okay, so Ramey announced to the press that the flying saucer was only a weather balloon. General Ramey empties Roswell saucer. They're walking it back. There's General uh, George Wilcox, the sheriff on the left there. After more photographs with the weather balloon, Ramey ordered Marcel back to Roswell with a strong hint to keep quiet about the incident. When Marcel got back to Roswell, he found that he had been made to look rather foolish for not recognizing the debris as a weather balloon. Highly qualified man, and he couldn't identify a weather balloon is what they're saying. And again, he's promoted to one of the most sensitive operations, Operation Crossroads, listening to Soviet explosions. Three months later, Marcel was promoted to lieutenant colonel and assigned to a program for determining whether the Soviets had detonated a nuclear weapon by anal analyzing particles in the upper atmosphere. So yeah. If he was that much of a buffoon, why was he promoted? Now, when he was interviewed in 1978, he maintained that the debris he found on the Foster Ranch was definitely not a weather balloon. And the depiction on the right is an artist's rendering taken in 1996. He insisted it was nothing like he had ever seen. 
But what about the memo in General Ramey's hand? What did it say? See that? Some researchers claim the telegram, which appears in one of the 1947 photos of the balloon debris in Ramey's office, contains text that confirms that there were aliens and a disc was found. There it is in his left hand. Let's zoom in. They claim that when enlarged, the text of the paper General Ramey is apparently holding in his hand includes the key phrases, the victims of the wreck, and in on the disc, plus other phrases seemingly in the context of a crashed vehicle recovery. There's the blow up right there. And apparently it says, and the victims of the wreck. That's the interpretation of that blurry teletype. In the disc, they will ship. The Ramey memo, they call it. Skeptics claim that the text is indistinguishable and cannot be properly translated. Brigadier General Thomas DuBose, Chief of Staff to General Ramey said in an affidavit, the material shown in the photographs taken in Major General Ramey's office was a weather balloon. That's DuBose on the right. The weather balloon explanation for the material was a cover story to divert the attention of the press. In several interviews, like Marcel, he indicated they substituted the material they had brought in from elsewhere for the real debris, which he said even he was never allowed to see because of all the secrecy. So he's saying there's two sets of debris and there was a, a walk back story. DeBose says his, uh, the deputy chief of the Strategic Air Command, General Clements McMullen, ordered him by phone to start a cover-up. Several days before the press photos were taken, DeBose said McMullen also ordered a shipment of debris from Roswell to Washington by cur a Colonel Courier and was subsequently flown onto Wright Field for analysis. Again, this doesn't fit the narrative. He's saying even before it was reported to the press that they already had sent uh, the material to Washington uh, and then on to right field in Dayton. Inconsistencies. McMullen ordered absolute secrecy, said DeBose, and said it was so secret it was beyond top secret. DeBose was not to discuss this with anything, anybody. So either it's uh, not from this world or it's Project Mogul listening to the Russians. McMullen said, look, why don't you come up with something, anything, anything you can use to get the press off our back? So we came up with this weather balloon story. Somebody got one and we ran it up a couple of hundred feet and dropped it to make it look like it crashed. And that's what we used. Actually, it was a cover story, the balloon part of it. Somebody cooked up the idea as a cover story. We'll use this weather balloon. We were told this is the story that is to be given to the press and that is it. And anything else, forget it. And McMullen told me, you are not to discuss this. This is more than top secret. It's beyond that. It's within my priority as deputy to George Kenney, and he in turn responsible to the president. This is the highest priority you can exhibit, and you will say nothing. Brigadier General Arthur Exxon, former commanding officer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, stated, I know that at the time of the sightings happened, it was to General Ramey, and he, along with the people at Roswell, decided to change the story while they got their act together and got the information into the Pentagon and into the president. Also, we said all these guys at the top of the government, such as Air Force Chief of Staff Carl Spatz, Secretary of State uh, of, of Secretary of Air Force Stuart Symington, uh, his son Fife Symington would be involved in the Phoenix Lights of March 1997. They were the ones who knew the most about Roswell, New Mexico, and they were involved in, in what to do about the residue. According to Brazel's neighbor, Loretta Proctor, her seven-year-old son, Timothy, or D, was with Brazel when he first discovered the debris field. But he was also with Brazil when he discovered something else at another site, two and a half miles to the east, that left him deeply traumatized for the rest of his life. He never told her exactly what he saw there, but he did take her to the location in 1994, saying, here's where Mac found something else. Frankie Rowe was the daughter of Roswell fireman Dan Dwyer, and her father told the family of being on a, on a run outside of Roswell to what they thought was a plane crash. He said it was a crash of something that was not from the earth. The crash left a lot of pieces of small material around and two small bodies and one person walking around. A live alien? He said it was from another planet. They were very small and the one that was walking around was about the size of a 10 year old child and it didn't have any hair and it had very small ears and rather dark, large eyes. Again, the story takes a left turn here about an alien walking around. They had a one-piece suit on that covered the whole body, and afterwards she claimed that the military threatened to kill the whole family if they talked. Barbara Duggar, granddaughter of Sheriff George Wilcox, right-hand corner, said her grandmother, I Inez Wilcox, told her the sheriff had gone to the ranch and seen four alien bodies. 
My grandmother said, don't tell anybody. When the incident happened, the military police came to the jailhouse and told George and I that if we ever told anything about the incident, not only would we be killed, but our entire family would be killed. And others said that Inez Wilcox told them similar stories. Lieutenant Walter Hout, Roswell Public Information Officer, in his 2002 affidavit claimed an elaborate cover-up was carried out. On Tuesday morning, July 8th, I would attend the regularly scheduled staff meeting at 7.30 a.m. Besides Blanchard, Marcel, CIC Captain Sheridan Cavett, some other senior officers, and from Carswell Army Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas, Blanchard's boss, Brigadier Roger Ramey, and his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas J. DeBose, were also in attendance. Okay, so now Hout's saying that Ramey is in Roswell now in 2002, and DuBose is also there. He's changing the story. The main topic of discussion was reported by Marcel and Cavett regarding an extensive debris field in Lincoln County. A preliminary briefing was provided by Blanchard about the second site approximately 40 miles north of town. One of the main concerns in 40 miles, I just heard two and a half miles uh, away from the original site. One of the main concerns discussed at the meeting was whether we should go public or not with a discovery. And General Ramey proposed a plan, which I believe originated with his bosses at the Pentagon. Attention needed to be diverted from the more important site north of the town by acknowledging the other location. That sounds like an army plan. Too many civilians were already involved and the press already was informed. At approximately 9.30 a.m., Colonel Blanchard phoned my office and dictated the press release of having in our possession a flying disc coming from a ranch northwest of Roswell and Marcel flying the material to higher headquarters. In addition, Hout stated that he was aware two separate teams would return to each site months later for periodic searches for any remaining evidence. Major Jesse, a. Jesse Marcel's daughter-in-law, Linda Marcel, confirmed that at the end of his life, Jesse had spoken of another crash site at Roswell with bodies. Deathbed confession. Jesse Marcel Sr. told his family that there was more than one Roswell-related crash site. He also confirmed that through an entrusted source, he had learned there were in fact recovered bodies at another site. So again, looking at the map here, we're coming to a close. Here's where the crafts and the bodies were originally found outside of Roswell and then the debris field just to the southeast of Corona. Mortician Glenn Dennis said the Roswell base called him asking for small caskets for three corpses that had been recovered. Soon after transporting an injured airman to the base hospital, he saw, Dennis said he saw strange metallic objects in an ambulance and he ran into a worried nurse friend inside the hospital who warned him to leave and he was then threatened by an officer who had thrown him out. The next day he went to the base to meet the nurse. She described an alien autopsy and drew pictures for Dennis of alien corpses she had seen. She said the head was disproportionately large for the body. There were three bodies, two were very mangled and dismembered as if destroyed by predators and one was fairly intact. They were three and a half to four feet tall. They had four long fingers. They had to move the operation to an aircraft hangar because of the horrible stench. Mortician Glenn Dennis then said he received a death threat from the base hospital from a redheaded captain who warned him that if he talked, somebody would be picking your bones out of the sand. The following day, Sheriff Wilcox talked to his father, a personal friend, and said, tell your son that he doesn't know anything and hasn't seen anything at the base. They want you and your wife's name, and they want your and your children's addresses. His father told him about the conversation with the sheriff, so Dennis related the events of the previous day to him. And Dennis also claimed that the nurse who confided in him, which he called Naomi Self, and her name never shows up in any records, subsequently was shipped off base, and attempts to contact her via mail resulted in letters returned with deceased marked on the envelopes. Now, they do not return letters back in the late 40s that say deceased on them. They just return to the sender. I don't believe Glenn Dennis. He also claimed that the nurse who he identified as Naomi Self also made drawings of the aliens that she had seen in the hospital. And here are the drawings that he drew, and he said that she drew these. The Anaya family told the story of picking up Lieutenant Governor Joseph Montoya at the base and a shaken Montoya relating the story of a crashed craft and seeing alien bodies in a hangar. Montoya then warned them and in future visits not to talk about it because somebody in the government might come after them. They said they also received a warning from Sheriff George Wilcox and New Mexico Senator Dennis Chavez. Years later, many people came forward claiming to have witnessed either Roswell debris or dead aliens or being part of the alleged cover-up. Many of these 
uh, people that have backdated themselves into the story. They have been proven to be hoaxes or outright lies. Some deliberate publicity seekers and authors who published articles that are rife with falsehoods. It's been nearly, it's been over 70 years since the incident and we are only left with the hearsay stories from the children and grandchildren of direct and indirect participants or alleged witnesses to the Roswell event. Personally, I believe that a lot of the stories that came out in recent years are crap and it's time to quit Roswell. Today, Roswell embraces its association with the Roswell event of 1947. It's proud to be called a tourist trap, complete with paid tours to the alleged crash site, the Corn Ranch on the right, gift shops, memorabilia, and at one time, two museums. But the only absolute truth about the Roswell UFO event is that we may never know the truth. Thanks for listening. I believe in UFOs, but I do not believe in most UFO researchers. All right, Robert, turn it back to you, buddy. Who has any questions? All right, uh, thanks, thanks so much, John. Um, so actually, no questions yet in the chat. Uh, we'll give people a few minutes to type those in. And uh, wanna thank everyone for sticking with us. Uh, only one or two people uh, dropped off early, so that's great. Uh, let's see if we can get five good questions for John. So if anyone has any questions or comments, type them into the chat. If anyone wants to ask a question via video, um, you can raise your virtual hand or you can indicate in the chat that you'd like me to unmute you and you can certainly ask the question via video. So we'll give it a, another minute or so. Yep. So, so Robert, I can just, while we're waiting for a minute or so is um, when I first went down there in 1995 and 1996, the 1996, the excitement. It's true. It, we were on the, the verge. We had the government on the ropes. Government trotted out Project Mogul in 1994. Then they said it was alien test crash dummies that didn't take place until the late 1940s. And they were trying to cover up the cover up. And they made it worse. And there were a lot of people that backdated themselves into the story. Glenn Dennis' story has changed uh, over the years. I believe he passed on. Uh, Frank Kaufman said he had seen alien bodies. He said he was a sentry there. Guy by the name of Jim Ragsdale said he was in the back of a pickup truck, pick truck that night with his, with his girlfriend when he saw the saucer come down. Uh, they've all been proven to be deathbed affidavits and hoaxes. And I guess we all know nowadays affidavits don't really mean much of anything. So I went back to the original incident, the original books, the original articles, the original quotes, and then from there, it looks like this alien body story comes from Johnny McBoyle, um, a radio reporter. And I've always been under the assumption you can't have just one flying saucer crash. They didn't all of a sudden radio back to planet Zeltar or from wherever they're from and design out that deficiency in the aeroform. So, all right. Any other questions? Uh, John Hammer, how are you, sir? Yeah, John. Good, good. Go ahead, John. Well, I'll tell you, John, this is a remarkable story and you've done an awful lot of research. It's fascinating. Fascinating to hear what you've got to say. Um, I recently saw a program uh, by one of my favorite personalities on TV, Josh Gates. And he talked about uh, his investigation of Roswell and new, um, new, um, uh, technology that can decipher the text that uh, that talks about victims of the crash um, and the uh, the fellow who is the court appointed expert who has testified as a court appointed expert on um, writing and using this new technology uh, determined that it does not say victims it, it says something entirely different and so that one is out, but still it does not disprove any of the rest of the story that you have told us. And, uh, and undoubtedly the cover up that took place. Wow. wow. Excellent. John, I didn't know that. Great. That's great. Appreciate that. So, so they're just counting now the memo. And, and I got to tell you something, I believe in life elsewhere. And if there's life elsewhere and they have a billion year head start on us, you can bet that they, they've been able to be able to uh, manipulate space, time the speed of light i always have been thought there's something faster than light and if they can travel across a galaxy or across the universe and suddenly they crash into a a, a, a cliff or an arroyo outside of a, a sensitive military base it just doesn't make sense it's can ufos actually crash can they think about that uh the, 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 
I love the description of the material tests that were done by the people on the site. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating. These are obviously, obviously otherworldly um, uh, materials uh, that we can't understand. So, John, I want to I want to save Project Mogul just with the talk and Lexington, but but when you're talking about material that can't be bent, can't be burnt, lightweight, five pound package of all the material, um, and Jesse Marcel, who was made to look like a fool, but then promoted, uh, you you've got to say that where is this material coming from? I mean, you, the United States was just kicking back into their manufacturing gear and, and their the new industrial revolution of the 20th century, but we didn't have anything like that in the arsenal. And all of those descriptions of those little, the tape, the scotch tape, the balsa wood, couldn't burn it, they're all consistent. So I believe the story of the debris, it's when the story takes a turn that there's a flying saucer crashing bodies and they can't even get their story straight. And uh, there's one walking around, Frankie Rowe, who always cries on a dime. It's, it got so absurd for me to the point, um, and if you use Occam's razor, right, that Maybe uh, there wasn't a second crash site. Now, I'm just going to close with this. And I know we're running into There's a story I want you to look up, John. Barney Barnett, okay? Yeah, you're familiar with that? The Plains of San Augustine? Okay. That story of a UFO crash with dead bodies came out before Roswell. And I've been out to the Plains of San Augustine, Old Route 12, Old Horse Springs, where Stanton Friedman directed me, and I walked the field. And then after I saw some scorpions, it's right near the, um, uh, the radio telescope uh, array, out there, the very large array. But uh, look up Barney Barnett, because that's a fascinating story. And it could be that Roswell plucked the Barney Barnett story and rammed it into this story of recovered debris. So, but thank you, John. Great thank information. You. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. And, and, I, and I muted to Jack because we were having a little bit of feedback. But thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions. Uh, Sharon says uh, many interesting points. Thank you. And Deborah will wrap us up tonight. She wants to know if the Blue Book is a published document. Okay. Yes. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and <laughs> I would rather read fiction authors before I read Project Blue Light of uh, Blue Book. It's, it shows um, uh, you know, swamp gas and they, they literally assume you know, these witnesses, these civilians to be imbeciles. So yes, you can look it up. And this, when they closed it down in 1969, Project Blue Book, there's still sightings going on. There's been a rash of triangle sightings. I mean, you can look at these flaps. Uh, one took place in 1997. We had a triangle invasion over the central part of the United States in, in the year 2000. I've never seen a UFO. I don't want to see a UFO. I'm an avid amateur astronomer. Um, but these cases are still going on. And recently, and I made this prediction 30 years ago, that they would, when the government finally discloses that UFOs exist, no one will care. It won't even make the news. It won't even be after sports or before weather. And what's happened with the Navy now is releasing these videos saying, look at these, these uh, objects that are, that are going at incredible speeds. Disclosure is taking place as we speak. And basically, um, and you've seen the um, Unexplained series on, on uh, TV, but they want to know uh, what they're made of and where they're from. So <laughs> disclosures taking place right now. The government, or at least the Navy, has come out and said that unidentified flying objects exist. Here's some footage of objects that aren't ours performing incredible maneuvers at incredible speeds. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Wonderful job, as always. Want to thank the friends of the library and Tewksbury Cultural Council for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, reminder, everyone will be receiving an email tomorrow morning with a uh, survey, and I'll also include uh, a link to this recording. So again, thank you all so much for coming and hope to see you soon. Thanks again, Thanks John. Everybody. Yep. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Peace be with you. And also with you. Thank you.